thank you so much for tuning in this morning. It's a pleasure and a privilege for me to be with you. Hey, take this opportunity to be able to share these broadcasts with your neighbors, friends, and family. You can just share our YouTube channel with them. And of course, you can locate them on our website, ChristCovenant.cc. Thank you so much for your prayers. Been praying for you. We want to encourage you again to reach out to one another and stay connected and to be able to really enjoy the body of Christ, even though we might be apart. You know, last week I began a new series of sermons looking at Psalms 91, discovering that God is our only safe place. Last week we looked at God's presence in verses 1 through 4, and this morning we're going to look at God's protection in verses 5 through 13, and next week we'll look at God's promises in verses 14 through 16. Again, I want to encourage you to read the scriptures for yourself and use these broadcasts as an opportunity maybe to understand God's word a little bit better and to be encouraged and refreshed. I want to remind you that the sermon notes are found on the website. It's under the media tab and you can go to the sermon there and you can uh, download the sermon notes. I know that many of you enjoy those on Sunday morning. As I shared with you last week, Psalms 91 has been a source of encouragement and comfort throughout the ages. For those who face the snare of the trapper, deadly pestilence, terror, or assault. In the first four verses, we looked at God's protection as we experience turmoil. Uh, let me just read those scriptures again. They're so rich. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. He will say to the Lord, My refuge, my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. For it is He who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His pinions, and under His wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and bulwark. Now this morning we're going to look at verses 5 through 13. And these verses describe God's protection. Now remember that Psalms 91 is part of what Bible literature calls Hebrew poetry. And remember as I shared with you last week, the key to understanding Hebrew poetry is that the poet is concerned with matching ideas instead of matching rhymes. We see that the Hebrew poets, well, they were wordsmiths. They were thoughtsmiths. And they used words to create visual images to create for us a picture that reinforces the main point of the psalm. Hear now the word of God from Psalms 91 verses 5 through 13. You will not be afraid of the terror by night or of the arrow that flies by day, of the pestilence that stalks in the darkness and the destruction that lies waste at noon. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will only look on with your eyes to see the recompense of the wicked. For you have made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil will befall you, nor will there any plague come near your tent. For he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all of your ways. And they will bear you up in their hands that you will not strike your foot against the stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra and the young lion and the serpent you will trample down. That finishes the reading of God's holy and inspired word. Thanks be to God. While some may look at these verses as the psalmist rambling on and repeating himself, actually this section is a masterful poem with parallel ideas that develop a pattern. This literary style is what is called parallelism. Now, within Hebrew poetry, we see a lot of what is simple 
parallelism. It's the most popular form of parallelism in the Psalms. A simple parallelism is when one idea is directly followed with a supporting idea. Let me give you a couple examples. Psalms 25. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. You see how the first line, make me know your ways, O Lord, is supported by the same idea using different words. Teach me thy paths. Let me give you another one from Psalms 42. This one you might be aware of. As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for thee, O God. We see how the psalmist uses what we see in creation as the deer panting for water, and he uses that to form an imagery to teach us that that is the way our souls should long for God. These two verses are examples of what is known as simple parallelism. But Psalms 91, we see what can be called complex Symbolism. Complex symbolism is when there's a group of verses that are followed by supporting ideas. And these groups of verses, well, they develop into a pattern. And in Psalms 91, verses 5 through 16, we see the pattern is God's protection then God's protection from all adversaries, and then God's renewed promise for protection. And that pattern is followed again, starting with verse 11, God's protection, God's protection from all adversaries, and God's renewed promise of protection. So what we see here in Psalms 91 is the pattern, the cycle is given two times. And not only do we see the flow of the pattern, but we also see the connection of the ideas. Let me try to bring this together for you. God not only provides protection 24 hours a day in verses 5 and 6, but then in verses 11 and 12, He promises to send His angels to provide protection for us. Not only does God uh, provide protection from all adversaries in verses 7 and 8, but we see that He promises us that we will be victors over all adversaries in verse 13. God concludes the pattern in each cycle by his renewing promise to protect us as he does in verses 9 and 10, and then he does it again in verses 14 through 16. Again, I want to remind you that the sermon note sheets are online, which it might be helpful for you to really understand the pattern and understand the cycle so that you can get the most out of this portion of God's Word. Now that we understand the pattern of the poem, I want us to look at each group of verses so that we might gain confidence in God's protection. The cycle begins in verses 5 and 6 where God is offering His protection. You will not be afraid of the terror by night or the arrow that flies by day or the pestilence that stalks in darkness or the destruction that lies waste at noon. Here we see God provides protection from terror, from flying arrows, from pestilence, and from destruction. Now, one should understand that this is no way to be understood as an exhaustive list. It's rather just a, a summary of possible attacks that might come upon God's people. My point is, is that one shouldn't be so naive to think that only because God mentions arrows, that God isn't going to protect us from missiles. That's not the point. The point is, is that God provides protection for His people. But the real main point of verses 5 and 6 is that God provides 24-hour 
a day protection, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and even on leap day. The Lord in this text tells us that he provides protection from the terror, notice, by night. And the arrows by day. And the pestilence that stalks in the darkness. And the destruction that lies waste at noon. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, when we read verses 5 and 6, we should be greatly encouraged to know that our God never sleeps nor slumbers. Our God is omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient. Our God provides 24-hour protection for his people. The poet moves on now to tell us that God provides protection from all adversaries. In verses 7 and 8, a thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. As I mentioned last week, soldiers of every stripe and rank have quoted this psalm as they've gone into warfare. And therefore, it is labeled the soldier's psalm. But the main point of verses 7 and 8 is that the Lord provides protection above all odds. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. The modern imagery is what we see in our movies of our heroes that are walking solo into gunfire. And even though there are hundreds and thousands of the enemy shooting at our hero, all the bullets miss him. He walks through and finally he overtakes every one of those wicked enemies. And then he finally comes to the ultimate villain and with one punch, he knocks him unconscious. He has survived amazing odds. And that's the point of verses 7 and 8, that God will protect us above all odds. It's one against 10,000. And while some would never take those odds, the child of God, well, they rest in the reality of God's protection for his children. While most would consider the odds of one against 10,000 to be like sheep being led to slaughter, we know that we are overwhelmingly conquerors through him who loves us. We are convinced that because of God's promised protection, that there is nothing able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Now at this point, the, the, the psalmist has reached the peak of the cycle. And therefore, starting in verse 9 and then 10, he tells us about God's renewed promise for protection. He returns to the reason why we are clinging to the promises of God. For you have made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High your dwelling place. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. Now again, I want to emphasize that this does not mean that a believer will never suffer. Jesus himself has told us that in this world we will have tribulation, but we are to take courage because he has overcome the world. Brothers and sisters, even though the rain pours and the wind blows and the floods come, we have placed our faith on the solid rock, which is Christ Jesus. Therefore, we wait for the storm to pass while, we'll, while we are clinging to the promises of God. 
The Lord is our refuge. The Most High is our dwelling place. Therefore, whatever happens, we know that no evil will overtake us and no plague will devour us. Now, at this point, the cycle has been completed. So the poet returns to the pattern describing God's protection. He starts again the pattern in verse 11 and then 12. For he will give his angels charge over you to guard you in all of your ways. They will bear you up in their hands that you do not strike your foot against a stone. Now, instead of describing God's 24-hour protection as he did in verses 5 and 6, now the poet focuses in on God's divine protection. God's divine protection through his own security force, his angels. He will give his angels charge over you. Now, while some think that the whole concept of angels is strange, the fact is that angels are the Lord's servants, worshiping the Lord and caring for God's people as the Lord directs. Now, some like to think that every believer has one guardian angel, but the fact is that all of God's angels are at His disposal to watch over all of His children. The promise here is that God has commissioned His angels to guard us. And this commissioning of His angels well, it reminds us that there is a spiritual reality, a spiritual dimension. Now, in the last several weeks, this virus has been called the invisible enemy. And we know what people are talking about when they use that phrase. But it's important for God's people to know that there is an invisible enemy. And that enemy fights against us every day, even though we don't see it with our eyes. Now, I know we don't talk about this a lot, but we need to know that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against rulers and against powers and against world forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, we are to take up the full armor of God for which He has given us. And even though we don't know exactly how the Lord's angels protect us or how they even fight our spiritual battles on our behalf, the writer of the book of Hebrews tells us that we should show hospitality to strangers. For by doing so, some have entertained angels without knowing it. This is a spiritual reality. But the most striking thing about what the poet tells us in Psalms 91 about these angels, God's spiritual security guards, is that the Lord has commanded them to be concerned about our most minimal affliction. Notice, they will bear you up in their hands that you do not strike your foot against a stone. God is promising to provide protection against the most minimal affliction in our life, stubbing our toe. Now, in verses 5 and 6, we're told that God provides protection through terrorists, deadly weaponry, and pestilence. But here, in verse 12, we're told that God promises protection from the affliction that probably was caused because of our, of our own clumsiness and had nothing to do with any of those things. The point is that God's protection extends to our trials, great and small. God's protection, it extends from a global pandemic 
to stubbing our toe. God cares for us. Thanks be to His holy name. The poet moves on in verse 13, reminding us again of God's protection from all adversities. In verse 7 and 8, the poet emphasized God's protection over great odds, one against 10,000. But here in verse 13, the emphasis is on God's people not merely being survivors, but being victors. Verse 13 reads, You will tread upon the lion and the cobra and the young lion and the serpent you will trample down. The thing that would cause us the greatest fear, stumbling upon a den of lions or a nest of cobras, is the thing that the psalmist tells us we will be victorious over. Our victory is first seen in this word tread, which means to walk over or to make a stand over. It, it seems to me uh, like, like David standing over Goliath as he laid on the ground dead. The greatest of all enemies, David, he stood over him. The Lord promises that he will give us the strength to walk over, to take the stand over, the thing that we fear the most. And the imagery continues with the word trample, which means to stomp out or to eradicate. Here the Lord is promising that He will give us the strength to stomp out the thing that we fear the most. God has not called us to be merely survivors. He's called us to be victors, to be victorious. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Brothers and sisters, what is the thing you fear the most? The virus? The economy? The uncertain future? God here in verse 13 wants you to know that you will not just be a survivor. That you will be a victor. Through Christ we will stand victorious over these things. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? I want to challenge you today to open your heart to the Lord, to open your heart to the Lord, to create into you the pattern of protection in your life. I want you to be open to the Lord to develop this cycle of thinking where you go from God's protection to God's protection from all adversaries and then God's renewed promise for protection in your life. And you might need to do this several times a day. A cycle of the pattern of protection. This pattern of protection, it embraces God's 24-hour protection over our greatest and our smallest afflictions. The pattern, we see that God overcomes all odds on our behalf so that we would be able to stand victorious even in front of our greatest fears. This pattern causes us to cling to the promises of God for protection, even in the midst of the storm. Brothers and sisters, if God is for us, who can be against us? Let us be the people who during this time, during these days, say to the Lord, that He is our refuge and our fortress. He is our God in whom we will trust. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for this beautiful portion of Scripture that creates this pattern of protection that we so need in our lives because so many times 
The world seeks to capture us by fear or anxiety or uncertainty. Lord, we come to you today knowing that you, Lord, are the one who protects us 24 hours a day, that you care for us from our greatest needs to our smallest dilemmas. Lord, that you, Lord, will renew your promises to us day by day. Lord, thank you. Thank you. For you are the only safe place for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, I want to thank you so much for joining in with us. I want to thank you so much for your support of the church. I want to ask you to continue to pray for us. If there's any way that we can assist you, please let us know. Anyone in your community that might need help, please let us know. Let's seek the Lord together as we desire for His presence and His protection and His promises in our lives. If I can do anything for you, please reach out to me. Let me know. Give me a call. Send me a text. Write me an email. Thanks for being with us. And God bless you.